let us start on some of the other features of VSDL including specification of structure, the design of test benches, libraries, parameterization of designs and so on. Structural description like we had mentioned before consists essentially of two things. One is instantiation of components and second is the interconnection uh, of the components. That is all that is there in the specification of structure. Um, let us point it out uh, with a few examples. Let us say we want to create some hierarchy in our designs, uh, which means that I have a couple of components, I pick them up and I try to compose a larger design that uh, consists of instantiations of these two components, that is what these are and some interconnectivity we would like to specify. Uh, we would like to say that the output port of x1 is connected to the input port of y1. We would like to say that the input port of x1 is connected to the input port of that larger module. So, uh, this is the kind of uh, specification we would like to note in our hierarchical designs. Let us quickly go through these examples. So, I have x which consists of um, two input ports a and b and an output port c. The entity y has an input port a and an input port b. Okay. So, that is the port list for x, that is the port list for y. For the purposes of describing structure, it is not very important what the functionality is, right. So, the architecture contents are not very important from the point of view of uh, just instantiating and connecting components. So, it just happens to be an AND gate, but that is not very important. So, we are more concerned with the external interface of that uh, module or entity. Okay, so, but uh, this is the complete entity plus architecture for x and that is the entity plus architecture for y and we would like to establish this connection that I would like to create a larger module z that consists of uh, one instance of x, one instance of y and they are connected in the way that we have specified. This module z has ports P, Q and R. P and Q are inputs, both of which are connected to the respective inputs of uh, x1 and R is connected to the output of y1. This is the sample VHDL that achieves this instantiation and connection. It seems a little verbose, but there is not really that much in there. First of all, you have the external entity uh, that should be clear, there is just a port list there, nothing else. In the architecture, we have what is called component declarations. This is x c and y c are just the component declarations corresponding to x and y entities that we have written. They are called x c and y c just to indicate that we can call whatever name, it does not have to be the same name as the entity. Fine. The port list here is what is the port list of x, port list here is the port list of y. There is a configuration specification where we say for all instances of the x c component, you use work dot x, work refers to a library that we will come back, but that x is that entity that we had designed earlier, x is the entity, x a is the architecture. So, that is that is the entity, x is the entity, x a. So, this is the architecture and through that configuration specification we are saying that when there is an instantiation corresponding to that x c component, you use the entity x, but remember an entity could possibly have multiple architectures. The reason for having those architecture with a given name is that uh, you could have multiple architectures. So, but out of the several architectures that you could possibly have defined, x a is the one to be picked up. That is what that configuration specification is telling us. 
Sir, this for all is just a label or a keyword? All is a keyword. It says that for all instantiations of a component x c, you use uh, this. Okay. One other thing we do need to point out, which is uh, the need for an intermediate signal t to represent that uh, internal connection. The output of x 1 is to be connected to the input of y 1. But before that, let us see what the architecture statements are. So far, these are just declarations that we had. There are essentially two instantiation statements, uh, one corresponding to the instantiation of that x c component, other is the instantiation of the y c component. x 1 here says that we have given a name to that component, to that instance of the component and that is called x 1. I could if I wanted to create another instance of x c and I could call it something else, I could call it x 2. Okay. So, there is a flexibility to choose whatever name we want for our instances. Uh, it is not very obvious if I have only one instance, but the moment I have multiple instances, there is the need to differentiate between the different instances by giving them different names. Okay. So, that is what this is saying that this is the name of the instance, that is the name of the component, x c is the name of the component and I have a port map. So, instantiation is done, but after that I need to connect the ports that are there in that instance to things that are visible at uh, the higher level, the z is the larger entity for us. So, we connect them to signals of z, so that um, values that occur on p, q, t, r and so on are appropriately propagated into uh, the instances. Okay. So, there is a port map p, q, t. What is the point of this port map? We are saying that take the signals p, q and t, t is that internal signal that we have defined, p and q are input ports. You connect p, q and t, which are signals that are visible at the z level to the respective ports of that component a, b and c. Okay. So, that association is by the order of the signals that we are specifying, p would be connected to A, right? q would be connected to B and T would be connected to C. That is the meaning of an instantiation statement. Um, component name can be anything. Component name is what we have declared. Remember, we declared that um, yes, sir, uh, component. Yes, sir. We, we choose the component name. Right. Both the entity name and the component name and also the instance name are of course given by us. Right. So, these are the two instantiation statements. I have an instance name, a component name, a port map, the p, q, t that is the order in which I specify the signals and the association is done in that order. Right. So, A corresponds to p, b to q and c to t. For y one component, the corresponding component has A and C. So, there is one input and one output, both are of uh, bit type and we have specified T and R. T is that intermediate signal, R is the output port from Z. So, that completes our uh, hierarchical specification. Now, you see that um, the existence of the same name in two different port maps implicitly establishes a connection between those two uh, ports right, through that intermediate signal that we have declared at this stage. P, Q, R are externally visible ports, so there is no need for any further declaration, but uh, the T had to be declared internally as a signal that is not visible outside. So, that connection is established by first declaring an uh, internal signal and then connecting the output and some corresponding input to that same signal that establishes the connectivity. There are a couple of different uh, ways of achieving this mapping. What we have seen uh, just now is an example of port map by position, where uh, this order is important. 
right? Because that PQT, that is the order in which we specify the signals and uh, the association happens to the corresponding ports in the order in which those ports were declared in the component. You could also explicitly have a mapping by name where you, you have use a syntax like that. You say that the, that port of uh, that component is connected to Q, A is connected to P, C is connected to T. You see that if you do this, then there is no need to respect the order because you are explicitly providing the name anyway. In both cases, the mapping should be complete. Which one would be preferred out of these two styles? One rule of thumb, I mean this is part of a bigger methodology issue, but you can see that if the number of ports is small, two or three in this case, then just in the interest of reducing verbosity, you can just use mapping by position. But if you had 25 ports, then just in the interest of reducing errors of connection and so on, and just in the interest of completion, making sure everything is connected to the port and signal that you uh, would like to, uh, you may choose to explicitly use the named mapping. Okay, so that is all that is there about structure. There is a way to instance uh, designs, there is a way to connect them up, but there is uh, not much more that is there to be done. Once you are able to achieve structure through one level of hierarchy that we just uh, did, uh, you can easily see that you can extend that same idea to any number of levels of uh, hierarchy. You can have uh, entities inside other entities inside other entities and so on. So, there is uh, no limit to the uh, depth of that hierarchy that you can achieve using these simple uh, instantiation statements. Let us move on to the idea of test benches. Purpose of these is to test the correctness of uh, a particular design under test, which is one entity that we have written. After designing it uh, as part of the simulation, we would need to provide some input stimulus and observe the outputs during the simulation. And maybe also as part of our design itself, as part of our test bench strategy itself, compare the output that we are observing against expected outputs uh, to verify that the system is working ok. The test bench in this case is also a VSDL model. So, you do not use a different language environment, it is the same language environment uh, that you would use for a test bench. The difference of course, is that uh, this test bench is not intended for synthesis. You might not uh, be interested in creating a design out of it. The design is just this DUT part of the model. So, there are parts of our HDL model that are not really intended for taking down further. So, they are just intended for simulation, but they are not intended for um, taking further down into the design process. Okay, so, how do you model that test bench? This design under test is the entity that we have written. That is the entity that we would like to verify. Test bench could be designed as just a separate VSDL entity, just that is another entity. What kind of connection uh, would it have with the design under test? Since this test bench's responsibility it is to provide inputs to the design under test and observe outputs, you can see that I can do something like this. All the input ports of the design under test could be connected to output ports of the test benches, so that we can uh, drive them from the test bench. Uh, similarly, the output ports of the design under test could be connected to the input ports of the test bench, because that is how we observe the values of the design under test, maybe make some assertion about whether the observation is matching the expectation or not. You could also design it uh, somewhat differently instead of having a separate test bench as an entity and connecting them up hierarchically. It could also be that you have the test bench is a higher level entity that is instantiating the design under test and uh, uh, we just have a process corresponding to the testing that we would like to do. In any case, we would have processes inside the test bench entity perhaps, but whether you use one or the other is up to you. Let us quickly move on to a few other topics here. 
One is the idea of uh, library and package. Having designed a bunch of uh, entities, so some VSDL model, there may be a need to group them into a package. So a package you know, is a collection of components, but also some uh, other types of uh, features like data types and functions, procedure. These could be utilities that you would like to export to the user of uh, a set of designs that, uh, uh, that you have made. A library is a higher level entity that is a collection of packages. So there is some hierarchy in the way we build an overall uh, design. So that is what the packages and libraries uh, are. As an example, you have a util package that consists of a component. That component corresponds to an entity that uh, we have designed. There is a type definition. We are saying that my int is an integer within the range minus 7 uh, to 7, presumably because it is useful in the context in which that util package is going to be used. And there is some ut utility function uh, called comp that takes a bit vector and returns a bit vector. So, some functions and procedures, some types, maybe some uh, components. These could be grouped into a utility package that you would like to uh, provide to somebody. Of course, uh, the component would correspond to some entity that you have designed. The type is fine. The function here is just the declaration of that function. Corresponding to that declaration, we need to specify the body of the function, right? the implementation of that function. So, that is what uh, this is. So, as part of the package body, we would uh, include the implementation of uh, any such functions. Right? So, that would be an example of a package. Sir, the, that the return statement has to be written in the next line or can it be part of the same line? Oh, it certainly can be part of the same line, yeah. Okay, having defined a package, we need to use it. The use is done with uh, a statement like that, where inside an entity, I have a statement saying use that work.util.all refers to uh, an example of a library name, a package name and the respective contents of uh, that package that you would like to use in this design. Uh, all means that you just take all the components, uh, all the uh, types, all the functions. But if you would like, you can be more specific and actually give the names of uh, whatever features you are going to use from the package. With that, you can now create a signal of type my int, where my int was a type that was declared in that package. It is borrowed from uh, that package. Right? And similarly, uh, that function comp is something that is available from that package. So, whatever that package declared now is made available through the, the use clause here. So, here the comp is not synthesizable. We are not talking about synthesis yet. I have to go into the content of that function to check whether it is intended for synthesis or not. As it happened here, the comp function is just taking a bit vector and returning the inversion of that bit vector. So, it is a synthesizable code, uh, but in general, it is not clear whether it is synthesizable or not depends on um, how you have written that function. There. there are some standard and default libraries that the VSTL system comes with. So, there is an STD library with some packages called standard text IO um, and so on. The, the bit type, the time, integers, so some of these default types that we have already used are part of that uh, standard package. There are some text IO routines that we will look at. There is a default library called work. The reason we had work dot something in the design was that um, when you compile something, when you create a new entity and you compile it, it by default goes into a work directory. Okay. There are other packages, the most interesting of which is the standard logic uh, 1164 that models multi-valued logic. Let us take a look at what these are. Text IO is uh, a package that consists of some uh, data types and functions that are of a utility nature essentially. They help us interface with the text files. 
so reading and writing of text files can be done. If you first include the text IO package that makes available a lot of data types and utility functions. File is such a type, text is such a type, the file name is what uh, we have selected, uh, that is the file name. I have a line is a type string is a type. So, all of these are part of the text IO package. The way you would use them is you say read line from a file f that file is what is declared here into that one line which is a variable that you have declared. So, the read line essentially takes a line from a file from a text file and copies it into your variable like that variable is called one line. A read is a function that takes that line that you have read from somewhere from the file first maybe and extracts it into a string. So, you can see that you, you can read one line and then use multiple invocations of uh, read to get the next string and the next string and so on. Okay, so, that was just the text IO package. Clearly, the text IO package is not intended for synthesis. What would it be intended for? Test benches. Yeah, for test benches, it is very useful. You can provide your input in a file and you could use these routines to read the inputs from the file and exercise the design under test with it. Let us move on to another very important concept that helps us create generic designs, it is called design parameterization. Uh, so far, we have seen port list as the single statement that goes into the entity, but there is one other important statement that is called a generic list. There are two examples here of generic parameters to an entity uh, that is delay and width. So, both of these are generic parameters. What are we saying? Delay is of type time and by default, we initialize it to 2 nanoseconds, that width is of type integer and by default the value is 4. Then I have a port list in which I say A is an input bit vector whose range goes from 0 to width. You see the power of the generic uh, parameter is that uh, your design remains the same irrespective of how wide that bit vector is. Right? There is a need to design it only once, but uh, when we use it, right, when we instantiate that uh, entity E say, at that time we can provide the parameters. So, that way if the design is otherwise the same, there is a need to create only one copy of that uh, design, one original copy of that design. But at the time that we are instantiating using it in some way, maybe we have more idea about what the parameters are, we could actually provide the values. Instead of specifying the range to be 0 to 7, which we, we would do if this were an 8 bit vector that is the input, we are saying that our design conceptually is the same irrespective of whether that bit vector is 5 bits or 8 bits or 16 bits or anything else. Because not much changes, look at the content of the architecture, we are saying B takes the value of not A after some delay. Okay. So, not A is anyway applicable to bit vector irrespective of what is the width of that bit vector. That statement actually does not change, it is not dependent on the width of the vector. So, let us say you had two such invert designs. So, one was, so design D1 was doing an inversion of a 3 bit vector. So, some other design was doing the same thing, but on a 5 bit vector, right. So, you, same thing means the architecture part of it does not change at all because the not operation is anyway applicable to a bit vector irrespective of what is the width. So, we are… When we will uh, like call this in our main function as an entity, this entity E, then we will be able to provide the value of it. Yes, uh, how to use it uh, um, at the time of instantiation I will just get to, but conceptually we are saying that since the functionality is identical, let us not create two different entities 
for d1 and d2 and let us just create one entity called d in which we say that this is a variable width. So, that is what we mean by a generic design we should be able to actually provide the parameter later on, but the design itself since it is not changing across these uh, different widths, let us not have multiple copies of the original design. Packages can also have variables, libraries. Packages can have this entity, Re remember packages can have components. So, this entity could be a component in a package. So, the uh, parameterized designs could also be part of uh, uh, packages. So, this was one example. There is the other example of a parameterization in this same design. We are parameterizing the delay. The reason is the same whether you have a 3 bit uh, in input vector or a 5 bit input vector that architecture part of it need not change. Let us say instead of 0 delay now I want to provide some uh, non zero delay. Instead of uh, having two different designs in which one I say th the delay is 1 nanosecond and the other one I say the delay is 2 nanosecond, I am saying that I just declare delay as a parameter and I just say b takes the value of not a after delay. So, I do not hard code the delay, but I just indicate that as just another parameter to the design. I do not know, remember we have gone through that uh, delay argument earlier at the time we early on when we specify the functionality, we do not know the delays that may be at the end of the synthesis I know the delays, but I might not know the delays and I should not have to change my design later on once I know the delays. So, similarly for this 3 bit design and for the 5 bit design, I do not want to create uh, multiple designs merely because the delays are uh, different. Right. So, delay also is being included here as a parameter. So, that is a couple of very basic ways to parameterize designs. We should always be on the lookout for opportunities to design generic uh, designs uh, uh, in the entities that we are uh, uh, writing. Okay, so, that is just a creation corresponding to the creation of a generic entity, there is the need for us to actually create specific instance, so that we pass on the appropriate parameters. Certainly before simulation begins or before synthesis begins, we do need to provide the appropriate uh, parameters, because I just said so far that, well so far uh, in this example it is just the delay there is a parameter, but I have a width as a parameter. Certainly before synthesis I need to somehow provide what is the value of the width, because otherwise I do not have a, an appropriate design to create. So, let us see how to pass that parameter. So, uh, let us say I had this entity with a generic statement, there are other statements including port and so on, but uh, that is the parameter and rest of it is the same as the structural instantiation that we had seen earlier, but uh, there is just one difference. In that instantiation statement where you had an instance name, a component name, component name is C because that is how we have declared it. The component has a generic uh, parameter, so now I have the generic parameter also as part of the component specification. Now, I just like the port map that I had, right, I am, I am specifying those signals that ought to be mapped to the respective ports, I also provide a generic parameter through a generic map. Here I am saying 3 nanosecond is the delay that you should be using for that component that is being instanced. The default value 4 means that if you do not specify a generic map, if you leave that out, then we will assume that uh, the delay is 4 nanoseconds. Okay. So, if you did not uh, specify a generic map at all, then the default 4 nanosecond that is there in the declaration that would uh, take over. Right. Sir, yeah. what is the meaning of that line for all CUs work dot CAFC? Just about that. Oh, this <laughs> is that configuration statement that we had talked about earlier. We are saying that for all instantiations of that component C, you use that library dot that entity and that architecture. When we talked about instantiation, that is the statement that we had uh, used. 
Why is this there? It is so that uh, you can get that component from different architectures perhaps. This, you are declaring it as a component C, but uh, maybe at different points you want to retain the flexibility of picking it up from one library or a different library. So that is one. Other is for that same entity you may have multiple architectures. So you want to retain the flexibility of using one architecture or the other architecture and so on. That is what you are doing through that statement. Sir, here this uh, entity level what we have written is 4 nanosecond and down uh, we are uh, putting it so, if same entity is used in different architectures, can we say different different values for this time is equal to? No, this is an architecture specific instantiation. Right, this entity is being used, and that architecture <coughs> ARC corresponding to that uh, entity is uh, being instanced. So, for that instance, we are saying that the delay will be. The design itself is written in a way that the 3 nanosecond is just a parameter. So, for that instance that we have created, the delay will be treated as 3. We can create another instance for which I have a different delay. Here I have a different uh, delay, 4 nanosecond is the delay. Okay, there are a couple of other very interesting uses of this idea. Suppose you want to have a shift register kind of a design you want to create a structural design of uh, such a register uh, where the same clock is being fed to all the flip flops. So, these are just instantiations of flip flops all of these right and uh, the connectivity that you would like to have is this, but uh, what is interesting is that you want to have an n bit uh, shift register okay, purely structural design and the component that you are going to instantiate again and again that you have already designed that is just a d flip flop you have designed that you want to create a, a register uh, out of it. You can see that uh, conceptually that structure is identical irrespective of whether this is a 3 bit shift register or a 10 bit shift register right. We know exactly how that structure is replicated depending on how many bits are there. This is a good example of uh, a use of a generic parameter. So, let us say this is an n start from dff0 until dff n that is the design that I would like to create. How do I go about doing this? Problem of course, here is that each of these I know how to create a single instantiation I already know how to create, but the problem is that. Uh, there are n instantiations and I somehow need to have a variable number of instantiation statements. So, the idea that is used here is uh, just use a loop, uh, but it is interpreted somewhat uh, differently, but uh, let us take n as a generic parameter. This is a good example of uh, use of a generic parameter. Right? So, it is an integer, what do I need to do? Remember when I have two components that are instanced, this part of it is easy. You just connect that component uh, the input port to the input port of the shift register that is fine. This part of it how do I create? So, somehow there is an intermediate internal signal that I use to create for establishing the internal connections. So, what I would have is uh, let me create an array or bit vector from 0 to n minus 1 to represent all of these internal connections. There is a pattern there that is repeating, we should be able to use that pattern somehow in the model that we write. An intermediate signal t going from 0 to n minus 1 I can create. That part is fine, the last one is just connected to the output. So, those two the first instance and the last instance let me explicitly create through uh, these instantiation statements. Okay, so, this uh, dff0 and dffn. So, these are the instantiation statements, but the more interesting ones are the ones that are inside here. They are generated through a <coughs> loop in what is called a generate statement in, in VSDL. So, the statement looks like this. I have for i in 1 to n minus 1, generate is a keyword and I have that is the name of the entity, that is the name of the well this is the name of the instance, this is the name of the 
component, it is the DFF component that is being instanced several times. So, you create an instance and let us look at this port map statement. So, that refers to the creation of a particular instance like that, right. So, I have a DFF is there, the clock part of it is easy, all of these D flip flops are connected to the same clock anyway, clock, clock is an input port. So, that is connected there, but uh, we are saying that the input port is connected to, to T i minus 1 and the output port is connected to T i. Does that make sense? So, the effect of that is you have for one D flip flop, you have let us say T 4 being connected, clock and T 5. So, next time you go to the iteration, so when i changes to the next value from 5, so this is for i equals 5, right? you have i minus 1 and t i. When i equals 6, that corresponds to a new instantiation statement. So, so this is a d flip flop. You have another d flip flop that corresponds to what ports being mapped the second one is still clock. What is the first one? If i equals 6, then t 5 is what is being connected here and I have t 6. Now, these two ports, these two signals being the same implicitly establishes a connection between the two and that is nothing but uh, this kind of a connection that goes from the output of one instance to the input of the next instance. Right. So, this would be a nice way for us to create uh, a generic design in which the number of instantiations is uh, inside a, a looped generate uh, statement. So, this is what is called a looped instantiation. The number of instantiations is variable, it depends on what is the parameter that is being passed. Is it clear why we had these two special cases for the first one and the last one? What is the reason? So, for the first one, the input is not any temporary signal. Yeah, it does not fit that pattern that we just declared because the first one is connected to the input port. I have to give the name of that input port. The last one is connected to the output port. I have to specify the name of the output port. It is the internal ones on which I can do the looped instantiation. Even though the for loop in general can only be specified inside a process and the interpretation is a sequential execution, this looped instantiation statement uh, does not occur inside a process. This occurs at the level of an architecture, the generate statement. For, so, the loop being used for the generate statement is a special case where only structure, you cannot have other functionality being modeled inside that for loop. Yeah, you cannot have anything else, you can only have uh, instantiation statements. Yeah. Sir, would all instances have the same name? X? Actually, internally they have uh, different names, that is what the, the one to these uh, refer to. There is no way for me to specify different names here. So, even though from inside a simulator you could actually access the different names, but um, in terms of the specification it is just the same. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, remember even though this is a for loop, the execution here is not intended to be sequential. So, there is a, it's a very limited uh, class of statements that you can put out there, only instantiation statements and of course, when you blast this out, this is just one design that you are talking about, everything is parallel. All of these blocks of course, operate in parallel. Right. So, this entity will have number of flip flops as a generic parameter. Yes, that parameter n is uh, intended to be uh, controlling the number of flip flops or the number of instantiations. Then you will be instanti instantiating this entity. Then right. That is the time when you instantiate this entity, that is when the shift register, that is when you say what is the value of n.
and you can expect that all this uh, generate uh, statements that we have written they will be blasted out by the simulation or the synthesis tool in the way that we expect sir inside for loop it will be sequential only or well, this for loop is not intended to the way to understand it is as if it were sequential but as you can see there is uh, there is no other sequential statement that can uh, go in here. You cannot have signal assignment statements or variable assignment statements inside this for loop that is written at the level of an architecture. So, it is used uh, only to only to expand a compacted design that we have uh, declared in this way. So, all the uh, components which are instantiated all those components are concurrently uh, yes, instantiation and uh, structure does mean that uh, when you have uh, 10 different components in a design, all of them are executing simultaneously. Yeah. It is like there are processes corresponding to each of them and of course, all processes are uh, concurrent with respect to each other. Okay. Let us take a look at some interesting standards. Particularly, there is this standard logic uh, 1164 package that uh, is supported by all the tools uh, these days. It is intended to model the effect of CMOS logic in a more detailed way than what the bit uh, type uh, provides us. The other one is uh, also an interesting example of how generic parameters can be used. Uh, the vital refers to a timing modeling specification in uh, VSTL. So, both of them are examples of how we can use the standard features of uh, an HDL to create something that is uh, useful by a wider uh, community. So, the language is not really changing, it is the same, but we have just uh, uh, created new abstractions, new utilities uh, from the base uh, features of the language. So, CMOS logic has a few other things that are useful from the point of view of specifying a digital uh, design. The most basic of which is the idea of capturing current strength or tri-stating the output of uh, a design. Uh, this is very useful uh, in the context of designing interconnections, buses and so on. Remember, there was this uh, rule that every signal should have only one driver. So, from two different processes, you cannot assign to the uh, same signal, this will be an error. Uh, on the other hand, you can imagine any number of opportunities where this is useful to be able to have multiple drivers for a signal. So, the nine valued uh, standard logic type is uh, intended to cover some of those limitations of the bit type. If you use the bit data type, then there is no way to have multiple drivers. It would be an error to have uh, multiple drivers, but we can do something about it if we uh, decide to use the appropriate data types. Okay. Uh, there are a few other things. One is the idea of a do not care. I should be able to say for these conditions, this signal has a value that I do not care about. Why is this useful to be able to specify? What is the use of a do not care in a digital signal specification? Simulation time can be reduced, does it? Simplify design. How? So, design can be simplified. How? It can be generalized. It can be generalized to? Some do not care can be treated. Can be treated as a 0 or treated as a 1 depending on? Yes, it could lead to the logic minimization stage uh, possibly giving you a more efficient design. It is very important to be able to specify that I do not care about the value of this particular signal under these conditions, because then uh, we can use the appropriate uh, interpretation that helps us uh, generate a more efficient uh, design. So, being able to specify do not care is important. Remember, if you are stuck with the bit type, you have to say 0 or a 1, there is no way to say uh, to specify that I do not care about the value. So, do not care is one of those values. There are other kinds of values that are useful. Uh, we should be able to say the value of a signal is unknown. Why would it be unknown? There are various situations. Let us say you have a power up situation and so simulation has started, time has proceeded, but you have not yet assigned a value to a signal. 
what should that value be? This is not an error, right? So, we are interested in the value, we are interested in assigning a value to a signal at a particular time at 10 nanosecond. So, what value does it have between 0 and 10? If you make it of type bit, then there is a rule that says that all signals of type bit are initialized to 0. That is just the language uh, rule. So, in general, if you have a if you have let us say three different uh, it is a, a type which is an enumeration of uh, three different values, then the default is it just takes the first one. For bit the default is 0, because 0 is that first enumeration value that is all the rule is very simple of the language. This is independent of the type if we define our own types then it would just the simulator would just initialize the variables of that type to the first value in that enumeration that is all. But uh, so that means that we may possibly uh, lose out on some finer level of modeling, where we would actually like to capture this situation that the signal has not been initialized yet, as opposed to where the value is actually 0, whether it is an expected 0 or somehow by default, we did not assign 0, but the simulator has assumed a 0. This is a different situation, right. We might want to catch that situation, perhaps it is an error condition, it is not showing up in our simulation, but in some other simulation, when it is actually used, perhaps it will uh, show up. So, there is a need to indicate some other states that a signal can take, all of which do not get captured in the default type of bit that we had seen. So, that is the motivation for this 9 valued logic type. Uh, what are those 9 values? There is an uninitialized state, right? there is an unknown state, there is a forcing 0 and 1, these are the standard 0 and 1 that we already uh, know about for uh, you know from the bit type. Um, there is a high impedance state. So, the high impedance weak 0, weak 1. So, all of these effectively um, correspond to tri-stating logic. This could be useful for uh, designing buses and uh, uh, multiple drivers, tri-state buffers uh, and so on. All of these states are not necessarily uh, useful in every context. So, but uh, if you declare something to be of that data type, a uh, standard U logic data type, where the U comes from, we will just look at, but, uh, uh, but that is the data type uh, that the package actually provi provides to us. Okay. So, you can see that the uninitialized type U can be used as the filler for a signal value that has uh, not been assigned yet. If you are going to assign 1 to a signal at time 10, from 0 to 10, it would have an uninitialized value. Then onwards, it would take values that we are assigning in, in our design. X is an unknown state as uh, opposed to an uninitialized state. This, for example, could refer to cases where you are trying to design tri-stated logic and of course, there are control signals, there are zeros or ones or, or whatever, uh, right. And uh, normally, shorting is not allowed of the outputs, because that would correspond in VSDL to uh, multiple drivers of a signal. So, I have to do something about it. How do I actually achieve this shorting is something that uh, uh, we will soon get to. But uh, idea is this, I have uh, two control inputs and I have buffers and either 0 or 1 is passed, but you are not supposed to pass both of them, right. So, the point of permitting this kind of shorting of the outputs is that our control mechanism is such that either the first buffer is enabled or the other bu buffer is enabled, both are not enabled at the same time. But uh, that is something that is up to the designer, right. I might have an error condition in my design that is actually allowing that uh, situation to occur, both of them are enabled. Now, if both of them are enabled, you have shorted them and on one side I have a strong 0, from the other side I have a strong 1, then this resolves to um, an unknown situation. Ok. 
this is different from uninitialized where I did not assign anything. Here I am assigning something, but it could possibly be an error situation. From a debugging point of view, having such a state could be useful. Whether it means something in the design, it is not clear. What design it would correspond to? Clearly, that is the design that you intended. Uh, so, it may not correspond to some, um, you know, some interesting design. Nevertheless, from a simulation point of view, it is very useful because if I see excess in my waveform somewhere, then that should give me the hint that possibly something is wrong. Something is wrong with maybe the control signals. So, that is the intention and these are the nine states that are included in this uh, package. Uh, out of yeah. these values, besides yeah. the 1 and 0, none of them have any physical meaning. Like, I mean, oh, they have a physical meaning. What does this buffer mean? This also is a VSDL entity, right? Here it is just a structural design, but uh, the tri-state buffer, you understand what the tri-state buffer is in sequence? Yeah. So, how would you write the tri-state buffer? How many out? So, what is the first external interface? How would you write the buffer means? What is the entity? What is the architecture, right? What is the entity? That is my tri state buffer, right. So, I have A, B, C, where I have A and C are inputs, and B is an output. of what type I will have to make them of this type of standard logic uh, so that I can do other things with it. Now, what is the architecture? Entity, so this would have A, B, C somehow, right. Architecture in my begin and end, what would I put? So, what is the functionality? Let us informally specify what is the functionality of that buffer. If C is 1, then B takes the value of A, at least that is part of the functionality. So, if C, then B, else, yeah, else I want the B to be tri stated, right. So, I have maybe this is the simplest design I can think of. Z is the tri state thing. So, that is how I would uh, model my tri state buffer. Once I have that, this design can be easily created. This is just a structural design. I have two instances of uh, that same buffer, but these are different signals. Now, I am uh, well as of now not yet, but uh, I should be able to later on connect up these two to achieve the functionality I want. So, this is how I would model my tri state. Not very different, but uh, just the ability to have uh, other values than 0 and 1 is what is uh, permitting me to have something more complex. If it was just bit type, then you would not be able to model a tri state buffer. Okay, but uh, this is not completely resolved yet. As of now, we have only indicated the data type. We have to do something more to actually be able to model this situation where multiple drivers are connected. But so my question was like, if this is modeled into a physical IC, yeah, and I'm taking the output of the IC and observing it, yeah, what would an unknown or a uninitialized state look like? Like unknown and uninitialized states, both of those are simulation artifacts, right. The tri state on the other hand is a design feature. It is helping us uh, model situations like this, which is a real design. This is not merely a simulation, but the unknown and, tri and uninitialized states indeed are relevant primarily for simulation. Same thing will for uh, don't care also? No, don't care means something to the design that is being created. We just argued that uh, being able to specify do not care means that the synthesis tool could start from there and generate possibly a more efficient design. More efficient design means not this, this is a different design from if you did not specify do not care. Do not care has meaning to the design that is being created. So, the output like an output signal cannot be a do not care right. I mean I cannot observe a do not care signal on a device. Output, uh, I am just saying that I do not care what the value is, but a value is indeed there. 
Of course, it is a zero or a one, right? No, but if if two uh, uh, architectures are interconnected, so yes. output of one architecture is let's don't care. So okay. How uh, next uh, uh, architecture will treat that uh, don't care input? So what will be the output corresponding to that ar next level of architecture? So that I have two entities, one of which has an yeah, output port which is connected to the input port of the next entity. Now, this value turns out to be do not care. What does it mean in real life? It is not very different. It is if this is do not care, then that do not care is visible to that other entity. In the simulation, it is visible. Now, that internally here, you actually might have uh, a statement that says if uh, this is do not care, then the design is, is such and such. And if they are synthesized together, maybe you can have a better design than if uh, that do not care was not visible. But uh, in reality, you do make it a 0 or a 1 just like uh, we have seen in, uh, in the example of combinational logic optimization. You have a, uh, a table in which you say for that min, min term, the output is uh, do not care. Means that when you design the gates for it, you are at will to interpret it as uh, a 0 or a 1. Let us complete this story of multiple drivers to a signal that was one of the primary reasons for uh, the extension into multi-valued logic. So, by default, I have these multiple processes, right? let us say I have uh, three, uh, two processes and a signal and here, so I have this signal assignment statement A takes the value of 0. In the process, I have A is 0 and A is 1, A is 0 and so on, all independently all of this is allowed. But what this creates is like we had seen earlier, it creates a driver for A corresponding to that process, corresponding to this process and also corresponding to that statement. So, three drivers are created for A, this is not allowed. By default, this is not allowed. If this was of type bit, then it is not allowed. I have to do something to actually permit it because uh, remember my idea is to model something like this. That introduces the idea of a resolution function. Multiple drivers are permitted when a signal is declared to be a resolved signal. By default, signals are just normal signals, they do not have a resolution, but we have to specify a resolution function that is used by the simulation tool to determine what happens under this condition when two different signals are shorted. Okay. So, by default it makes no assumption, it does not even permit it, but uh, you see that uh, this depends on the technology. If it was CMOS then the rules are something, if that technology is something else then uh, you might have a different uh, rule. There may be a wired AND rule or a wired OR rule that does depend on what the technology is. On the other hand, the language does not uh, uh, necessarily want to be tied to a particular technology. Uh, so, it is left open. Uh, if you want that uh, kind of multiple drivers. So, two outputs being shorted means that there are multiple drivers. When there are multiple drivers, how to resolve is something that is left to us as the designer, but uh, because everybody is using CMOS as part of that uh, 1164 package, that data type of course is there, that multi-valued data type, but uh, how to resolve two bits that are uh, two signals that have that same type, if they are shorted, that is if there are multiple drivers, is something that is also provided here. But you would do it through what is called a resolution function. Let us see what is there in this resolution function. This is a function that we have to write, but in that package it is already written, but in general we have to write this. So, that is the name of the function. Bit vector here, so this is an example of um, just taking a bit vector and modeling this situation of you have a bit vector and what if all of them were shorted and uh, that is the output. What value would be there if all the outputs were shorted? So, if you have five different drivers, all of them are connected, uh, how will it be resolved? So, there would be a way for me to specify its resolution and uh, here is what I am doing. In that function, I have an accumulation that is happening. I have initialized that value to 1. Then in a loop that goes through the range of the values, 
that's through all the values of that bit vector. If there are five uh, bits, then it will go through the first bit, the <coughs> second bit, and so on um, until the fifth bit. I am saying you have a loop, and in that this is a normal loop. Remember, it is a sequential code. I have accumulation, so that accum being accumulated with the new, it is an AND operation that is happening with the new value that I have picked up. So, overall what am I doing with this? We are just doing the AND of all the 5 bits that are there. This is a bit vector because uh, effectively there are 5 things being shorted, but um, they are being treated as though it is a vector of bits that have come in and uh, that resolution function is going to resolve you know, what happens if they are connected. What we have modeled here is essentially a wired AND. Right? So, so, that is the value that is computed and we return that value at the end. So, if that uh, technology is something else then you would have to write your own resolution function. Okay. So, there is a way for us to write the resolution function how do I use it having created that function? The creation of the function itself is clear, right? So, you could replace that logic with some other logic that is relevant for you. Functions are sequential in nature. Yeah. Function body. Yeah. Always. Function bodies are sequential. Yeah. So, in that example where I have that standard u logic, u refers to unresolved there. This is the array that is used. There is a resolution table that is uh, just a constant table. Look at the way it is designed. This is a two dimensional array. Okay. So, each row corresponds to one value of a signal. Each column also corresponds to one value. This is a 9 by 9 array. Okay. What is this saying? Each element here corresponding to row i and column j carries the value of if value i were to be resolved against value j. If there is a conflict between value i and value j, what is the resolution? Right? So, if a 0 conflicts with a 0, then we will say that the value is 0. That is ok. That's, so, the way this table is set up is normally what is the expectation for CMOS logic. So, similarly, if a 1 conflicts with a 1, then that is the value. If a 0 conflicts with a 1, then these are uh, unknown states. So, you can see that uh, our other situation where I had this 2 tri state 2 buffers that were shorted. So, somehow the control signals were such that both the values were passed and uh, how would we resolve uh, it through the, uh, through the conflict. But on the other hand, let us say I have a tri state z that conflicts with a 1, it resolves to a 1. That would be the situation of our tri state buffers, where one of them has a value of tri state and the other one has a value of 1. 1 is the stronger signal and the output would be 1. So, you can see that that table itself helps us um, perform that uh, resolution. This is the equivalent of that uh, statement that we had, we had a loop earlier, right. So, and that AND operation that we had, instead of that AND operation for the CMOS logic, this table is what would be looked up. You can look up the entries and convince yourself that it makes sense. If u is uh, conflicting with anything else, it is resolving as u, right, either this row or that column, which makes sense. If the value has not even been un initialized, this is like a power on reset or something. We do not know what the value is and just to be safe, let us make everything uninitialized. If it is conflicting with some other signal, then let us make that conflicting signal also uninitialized. Okay, so, with that uh, table, then I can have a resolved function in which uh, the input is a standard u logic vector where we are doing effectively the same thing. Let us just by default initialize it to do not care, which is the weakest state. And uh, we iterate through the elements of that vector. Notice declaring it as a vector is uh, a nice way to get around the fact that you do not know how many signals are conflicting. Maybe it is 2, maybe it is 3. Where at the time of writing this function, you do not know how many signals are conflicting, right. So, you, we are just declaring it as a vector without men, uh, mentioning the range. 
Here we are just saying iterate through the range of that vector, which will take us through all the values that are actually conflicting. And we are just saying result is the resolution table value of result against S of i. You see that it uh, performs the same accumulation as earlier, but this time this is invoking that resolution again and again, taking two signals at a time. But one of them is the accumulated value for the other signals. Okay. So this is a function that we write. Okay, so so far I have that constant table for the CMOS for this 1164 logic, and I have this resolution function. So finally, I need to do the following: declare standard logic is a resolved version of that standard U logic. The standard U logic is what we started off with, that was the 9 state logic, that was not resolved. So, we say that standard logic, if you have a data type of standard logic, then this resolution function is applied on it, when there are conflicting signals. Okay. So, then I can create a signal x of type standard logic and then this is allowed from multiple processes, I could be assigning different values uh, to x, maybe it is a tri state in one, maybe it is a strong value in one and we know how to resolve it. So, if this was the case, then the value would resolve to one, because when z is conflicting against one, according to our table there, the resolution is one. Sir, in this uh, program, if we are sending x to input of anything, it will take one as the input. Yes, if x is, that is all that uh, I have and x is connected to an output port, then that uh, whoever is seeing that output port will see a 1. But all of this needs to be needed if you want multiple drivers in your uh, design. Most of the times you might not actually need it, but there will be some times when you need it, then it is essential to use a resolved uh, signal. So, we went through the steps uh, just to understand how this was. There is nothing new here as you can see, just the specification of a resolution function is what is new. We write the unresolved types, we write the resolved type, we specify the resolution function. All of this is open to the designer, we can do it in what, whatever way. But because this um, kind of resolution is so essential, it happens that uh, that standard logic type is already there for us. If we include that package 1164 logic, we do not have to write our resolution function. This what we just went through is already there as an implementation in that package. So, there that word resolved is not a keyword, right? It is not a keyword, it is the name of that function that we wrote, right. But this syntax is uh, what creates the resolution function. I say subtype, standard logic is a subtype of uh, standard U logic with that resolution function. Of course, when you are using that package, you declare a signal to be of that type and it is understood that the resolution function that we have just seen, that is what is applied. But sir, in that function we are not passing any values of this, right? We are not passing any values, but uh, the simulator will do this for us or if it is a synthesis tool that that will do this for us. If there are three signals that are conflicting, then what the resolution function sees is a vector of size 3. This is uh, transparent to the designer, but that is what is actually happening. So, it will happen the way that we expect functionally. Okay, let me stop here.